Welcome in, everybody, to another episode of Discard for Magic, a Summoner Wars podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Aaron. And I'm the other host, James, or Jexic. And today, it's fun to have Fuzzy Marmot. Hi. And Ben to 10. Hello, hello. We're happy to have you guys on to uh, Cornerstones of the Summoner Wars community. But why don't you guys just start out and just tell us a little bit about how you came to Summoner Wars. Fuzzy, why don't you go first? Okay, so Water D led me here. Um, I was interested in first edition, and as some people know, I kind of stalked it for a long time. Like, I read all the lore, and I tested it out on the app a little bit. But the thing that stopped me was the forum conversations about various things that felt broken, like you have to kill your own units for magic, and the game rewards turtling, and I was always just so close to pulling the trigger and never really getting there. You know, and the app AI wasn't very smart either, so I didn't get a great feel for the game. But I never gained online before Summoner Wars 2nd Edition. Like, I never played with real people. I game, you know, with my, at the time, with my husband, now with, well, at the time, my boyfriend, and now with my family. But it was a big jump to online gaming, and I just somehow never wanted to do that with first edition. Like, I never jumped from the AI to let's just play a game with people. But then when Waterdee wrote a big long review of Summoner Wars second edition on Board Game Geek, basically saying, hey, they fixed everything, I kind of had to try it. You know, I'd stalked first edition for so long. Here's the stamp of approval on second edition. And I knew the AI was pretty hopeless and wasn't expecting an improvement. So I just somehow jumped, for some reason, just took the plunge. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll just play the free factions against real people and see what happens. Once I started, I was hooked. But the fateful thing that happened was that I didn't think it would particularly appeal to my husband. You know, for whatever reason, we just, you know, he likes to defeat me economically, but not kill or stab me. So for whatever reason, I never bought the physical game. You know, I kind of thought, well, maybe this can be something I can just do in my spare time. And, you know, at the time we were busy with kids and there wasn't much time for gaming to begin with. So had I introduced the game to my husband and had he liked it, then I'm very sure I would never have joined the Discord and never have been part of the community. And you guys wouldn't have known I existed. You know, I, we'd be that couple that games together and is at home with our physical edition and cut off from the digital world. And that's why we game. As things turned out, I did end up gaming with the community for the first time rather than with my family, and we can go into that more later. But let's let's hand it over to Ben. A friend just sort of showed me the game, and then I was like, oh, this is cool. There's the upsides and downsides there of, like, there's so many good board games these days that, like, it's just... I just feel like there's so much you can miss <laughs> as, as a board game enthusiast. Or, like, just, like, walking through the various booths at Gen Con, I'm just, like overwhelmed by like there's there's like got to be so many of these games that i would like and so many that i wouldn't like and like i just it's just complete chance whether i'd find them or not in college i started playing a lot more board games uh with a club and w with friends and i think one of my friends had watched the shut up and sit down review and and found this game they had remarked that for them summoner wars seemed to be what war chests what they wanted war chests to be um that was like kind of just like a casual 2v2 kind of chess but also deck stuff I've, I've talked a lot about like why i find summoner wars special but like a lot of things just clicked for me i really i i like the vibe of just sitting across from someone and playing this 1v1 game i like that you take a turn and then and then you just have five minutes to sort of chill and talk or snack or something while while they think about their turn um, I had played some. I had played some Hearthstone when I was younger, and like I, I liked. I liked that. Like you, you take a you take a deck, you do your best. That game just didn't really have 
this level of strategic depth. And then Summoner Wars also, because like it has like the deck management aspects, the, everything's not determined. Uh, there's going to be dice. There's going to be better or worse draws. You can't just like account for everything um, in, a, in a series of turns. As someone that like I, I'd get overwhelmed by like playing chess or something, just by how much I could think, think in the future and, and about future turns. Summoner Wars felt more casual in that sense. But then the same sense, there's like that I always feel like I'm improving every time i play a game i feel like i get slightly better at playing a deck but like something sort of magical did just happen like after a few plays of the game I was like oh this game is it this game is great um and i just haven't really looked back since and i, I played it with friends in college for a while and then a lot of them started to fall off and so eventually I, I joined the discord and the league and started playing there you're telling me ben that you can't play every game at gen con i mean come on <laughs> <laughs> it's sad it's so hard like so many games that i found are just like a random recommendation from a friend or something and it's 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 hard to like well like fuzzy what you were doing of like actually like doing your own research and stalking a game i have a lot of respect for that <laughs> <laughs> i should add that 90 percent of the games i stalk i just never played because i had no one to play with and my husband has a pretty specific corner of games that he really digs into and I know that corner pretty well, but there are things like word games that I know he doesn't really love and party games that we never get the people for. So it's my weird relaxation hobby to read reviews of games that I know I will probably never, ever, ever, ever get to the table. And the dynamics change now that we have kids and we're playing kids games. Um, so it's ever evolving. But definitely the Summoner Wars community is a first for me in terms of really just finding other gamers outside of one person yeah it's interesting you talk about how like you find a game because like i probably wouldn't have found summon wars without heroescape and heroescape was just a gift to me from a friend who said who like wasn't sure he wanted it himself he's like he thought it looked cool so he got it for my birthday things led to another and eventually i find i found summon wars through heroescape maybe we, what we need to do is just like ha find friends who we think would like summon wars and just give it to them <laughs> <laughs> every christmas and birthday from here on out <laughs> Summon of Wars. <laughs> but Fuzzy, you mentioned you got, uh, you played with the free deck for a little bit. Do you remember what deck you got? Oh my goodness. Funny you ask, Aaron. I played with the um, Phoenix Elves and Tundra Orcs when those were the perma free decks. I was having a blast with them for a week or two, and then Plaid Hat Games rotated the free decks, and I had. Fungal Dwarves and Eternal Council, because those were the new ones, and they just come out. They had the starter set decks free for a long time, and then I think they intended for the free decks to be the new decks. You know, seemed like a good idea at the time. Of course, the new decks, being Fungal Dwarves and Eternal Council, weren't really the best introduction to Summoner Wars, one would say. I mean, I was pretty annoyed when they landed. Like, why'd you take away these fun decks and give me these weird ones? I agree, those were, like, two of the densest decks to, to get a handle on at first, I'd say. Um, like, at the end of the first, or second wave, I was just like, what is going on with these? Like, even me, as someone who had played a lot, I was just like, I don't get these decks at first, you know? <laughs> like... Funny thing was, though, I really ended up loving Fungal Dwarves. They were weird enough, and maybe the only deck that was weird enough in a way that kind of violated Summoner Wars basics that I was able to pull off upsets with Fungal Dwarves when they were brand new against top players that I would never beat again for a year. You know, Fungal Dwarves were so new and so weird that once I figured out their shtick, even without really being good at Summoner Wars, there was this brief window where I could win games I shouldn't. And that was fun. And I don't think any of the new decks are like that. I don't think a new player could waltz into Shadow Elves and learn Shadow Elves and beat a top player just because Shadow Elves revolves around so many of Summoner Wars fundamentals. But Fungal Dwarves violated enough of them that I just had an edge for a moment. And I'm sure that was another contributing factor to me getting deeper into playing competitively, which I also never anticipated. I kind of joined the league as a lark, and then I was like, but this is fun. <laughs> you know, I, I think I'm going to keep doing this. Profit mantra, right? 
of take a brand new deck and hope people don't know how to play against it in the <laughs> tournament. And... I also think that it's possible within the deck building space to come up with a good deck somehow if you're into that kind of thing and be relatively unknown and have good success. Like we've seen people that are relatively new to the scene at least. Like right now, Cheez-Its and Game Bear are like real life friends who just had been playing deck building against each other. And now they're like one and two or one and two and three on, on the uh, the ladder. So then they hadn't played as much base deck. Love it. Blood Summon is an annoying card, but Game Bear is not using Blood Summon. Really, He's playing other deck. <laughs> Blood Summon is a great card. Doesn't need to be changed. <laughs> <laughs> Tons of fun. Are we going to see the Blood Summon Rhinos make a comeback? <laughs> Hopefully at some point. Because I feel like your deck was that you ran in the last deck building tournament was pretty unique compared to the other Blood Summon decks I've seen. I haven't seen a lot of Koldak Blood Summon, and I have not seen much Rhinos at all. I've seen a lot more of Shadow Elves or the Baron Blood Summoning, doing cheesy things, going all the way to Glint and Demand and get like 19 dice off that. That's how Cheez-Its decks work for the most part. He just builds up cards and cards and cards and then blood summons all the way across the board and glints after the blood summon and plays demand and then with a warrior and and now they've even got one renewed hope in the deck so that Ooh. they can into darkness your blocker and then summon something there anyway so even if you have all th- all your sides blocked if it, if one of them's a common or a gate they will bounce it to your hand with into darkness and then kill you anyway i put a uh, thing in the deck building channel of that happening to me i don't know how many people watched it it's been a learning experience that sounds awesome i've stolen a couple games just being a little faster like getting brub out in the first half of the game and just mowing him down but otherwise it's been rough going you guys are both pillars of the community and fuzzy you fairly shortly after you like became a community leader you started a section of the discord for like female and non-binary players can you tell us a little about that that had been a long time coming i will rewind a little bit to when i first joined the discord and started playing i didn't have any particular intention of getting to know people or really you know having a reason to reveal my gender you know having a reason to just be anything other than fuzzy marmot Occasionally talking fungal dwarves strats because I can't resist talking about fungal dwarves, or at least couldn't at the time. Um, what happened then was that a couple conversations with Sire Buta about, you know, the lore and the cards themselves, the art, that kind of got my radar twitching. Like, I bet she's female too. And I wasn't really sure where to go with that, to be honest. Like, how do you just, like, mess, you know, do you message someone and ask, so, are you, you know, are you female? So, you know, we just hung out on the channels and occasionally chatted about the art or whatever. And then she made a comment, when Swamp Works was announced, um, she made a comment along the lines of all the gender-swapped summoners from First Edition. Takulu was male in First Edition and came back as female in Second Edition, with Silts also, and then Muglug, of course. And there were a couple others, too. And, you know, from my perspective, it was just kind of, well, good. (laughs) You know, thank you for evening out the gender ratio, and thank you for not making it just Sarah, who's weak. Um, But then when um, Sarah Puta actually envisioned it as, like, actually transitioning, a gender transition, and talked about that, there was one person that, you know, kind of made, you know, I think it was a thumbs down, you know, it wasn't even anything big. The conversation that followed caused her to come out as trans, which, you know, actually I, surprised me, you know, like I, you know, like it, it was just like a kind of just mental rearrangement, but hey, that makes sense. At the time, that motivated me to change my name to have my pronouns. And part of the reason was just coming out in support of Sire Buta. I mean, I responded privately. I wasn't really comfortable at the time, like, leaping into the conversation publicly. At the time, Plaid Hat Games wasn't a big presence on the forms at all. I actually kind of thought of them in this, like, sci-fi way of, like, you know, when there's aliens that create all this amazing tech and then leave. And then the plot of the sci-fi novel is like the humans kind of staggering around with the remains of this ancient civilization. Like that was how I thought of Plaid Hat Games at the time, as far as their presence on the Discord went. I didn't really 
know, you know, because no one did whether it was just going to be a free for all or, you know, where they stood on essentially attacks on identity. Is this going to be a free for all? And it, it wasn't like it really wasn't kind of this anti trans free for all. But there were isolated remarks here and there. And Jexic, you remember, you probably remember one of them when I floated the idea of having a women's channel or a women's tournament. When I said women's and non-binary, someone came in and gave me a bunch of grief. And I remember you messaged me instantly. Oh, good. I'm glad you kept your cool. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it wasn't a lot of these incidents, but it was just enough hostility that I didn't feel completely safe. And I should add, too, that the other the other element of the backdrop here was that, you know, there were raging debates over league format as well that I was part of that you might remember. And even though that was just about league, I think just kind of the aggression and being part of the aggression, you know, part of the fisticuffs made me want to create a known safe space. So at the point where I'd been part of the plaid had, you know, part of the community long enough to just have gotten to know Nick because he was playing league. So we'd interact in channels every now and then. At the time, I finally felt like I knew Nick well enough to just bite the bullet and ask, can we do this? Wouldn't have had anyone to ask during the first few months that I was part of the Discord. And Nick and I talked a little bit, and I did talk about not knowing where Plaid Hat Games stood. Pretty much within, like, the next day, the Server Rules channel magically appeared, and Plaid Hat Games did take a stand of just inclusion. I mean, you can read it now, but it was... I I hate to phrase it negatively, like, you know, no hate speech, no attacks on identity, etc., when really the message was, we want to be inclusive. That's the positive message. That's the positive spin on it. So I think those two things, like both creating the private channel and having explicit rules, you know, having an explicit welcome rather than this feeling that you're kind of allowed to exist. I don't know how allowed I am to to make a big deal out of gender. And definitely people have asked, you know, both, both Lena Lieb and Waterdee have asked the exact same question of like, why do you want to make a big deal out of gender? You know, not in, not in a hostile way, but just why not just play anonymously? You know, what difference does it make in a game like Summoner Wars where it's just, it's just brain power? And there isn't an easy or obvious answer to the question. For me, I think it just has to do with how much the social component of gaming is the thing that's going to keep me in the community and part of the game. Like, I'll get bored and drift off if all I'm really doing is playing competitively and not getting to know the person across the table from me, even if that table is virtual. If I'm talking about gaming with my family, I'm, I'm not going to pretend I'm a dad. If I'm asking for recommendations for kids' games, I'm not going to gonna be cute about blah, 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 my partner. Like, I think of him as my husband. So... I think the answer for me, like, why reveal your gender at all? The proximate reason was definitely Sarah Tupa coming out, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. I've never pronounced it before. (laughs) I think in my head I was saying, like, Sierra Tupa, but that's, I don't know, it's tough. I don't know. (laughs) I have absolutely no idea. (laughs) She can correct me later. Point being, though, you know, the proximate reason was her coming out and the big picture reason was really just desire to socialize once I was getting to know people better and realizing that the community was intrinsically friendly. You know, and, and I don't want to play up too much like a handful of anti-trans remarks over months. It really wasn't that much, but it was enough. Like Astro Cosmos came out publicly as trans as well, but I think a lot of people might have missed it because just buried in this lore discussion. I asked Astro Cosmos right before recording this podcast whether they wanted me to talk about this, and they gave me the go ahead and said yes. You know, it was actually buried in kind of a heated argument between the two of us over some of the faction designs and, you know, like art direction. So, I mean, I think it's easy to forget that it's a different experience for 
for the LGBT community to want representation versus someone like me wanting gender and racial diversity. I think there's also that aspect, whether intentional or not, the community, as with many gaming communities, is just so predominantly male. Like if we look at our podcast audience, it's 90% male and less than 10% identify as female or something else. And I think just having a community where you can be with other people who are like you in that aspect and share that aspect of the game with them just creates a bigger sense of community. You know, absolutely. I pretty much knew from the start that I needed to fly the gender flags high in order to get anyone to find anyone else. Because if everyone's anonymous, then, you know, you don't, you don't find that 10% of the audience that might be gaming anonymously and happy to. It kind of went on for a while where it was just me and Sayurputa for a long time. Um, and Astrocosmos. And Lena Lieb, I knew existed, but knew nothing about her. Because she still doesn't socialize on the Discord. And really barely touches technology. You know, I've, I've gotten to know her now. After forming the women's channel and basically being you know, almost ridiculous about it. Like, hi, your team Germany teammates refer to you as she, her. I, you know, I'm, I'm Fuzzy Marmot. This almost ridiculous shotgun introduction. But at the time, it was somewhat of a big deal for me knowing that there is a top female player in League who I knew nothing about it other than that she existed. And it takes pressure off when you're new, especially when I made myself visible quite early and before I was actually any good. And I've had this experience with a STEM career as well. You know, it's just, you just hate to be, you know, highly visible and just really not that good at the game. So that was one of the things that I think stressed me out a lot. But the payoff of essentially being out and being the person that other people could reach out to if they wanted outweighed the the stress and panic of what if I lose and make my entire gender look bad. It's never not present when you're that outnumbered. You know, you kind of represent, you know, like 100% of the known community. And really good for the community to have that rule section be out there and show Plat Hat's stance on it. But you guys have also done a lot for the community with the scuffles that you've done. And Ben, you run a Twitch channel and post YouTube videos. Was that something that you did before Summoner Wars or did it start with Summoner Wars? My role has been much more of just really only like organized live events and done the streaming. And real quick about like inclusivity, I could just say like the, the Summoner Wars server has always like ever since I've joined just felt like a very welcoming space. And so just like hats off to everyone involved in, in making it feel like that. There's lots of other gaming spaces around that can feel very toxic to join. So just thanks to everyone for that. Thanks to everyone who came before me, definitely. Like, I wouldn't have stuck my neck out if I hadn't already seen, hey, this is a pretty great space with pretty great people, and it's valuable enough to me to make me want to contribute. So it was absolutely a great space before I came here, and it's the reason that, you know, I stuck my neck out further. Thinking about, like, streaming and organizing events what first started for me it sort of happened accidentally i'd always had in my mind that like summoner wars seems like a very streamable game i'm a zoomer i grew up watching youtube and twitch live streams of different games and like watching people live stream hearthstone and whatnot i'm like man like i could totally see doing this for summoner wars and just like chatting about turns with people in chat and whatnot like that sounds like a lot of fun always and like i don't know if i'd ever like have time to figure out how to make that work and and whatnot. Since I came from live games, I never did too much public games. I did the league and like and I appreciate like the three day format for that. It's really nice to just like 
pull out your phone while you're in the bathroom and take a quick turn and then put it away. Like live games, my favorite way to play this game. And I really, I, I know, I know Plathead says live games are coming eventually, <laughs> uh, hopefully with the Steam release or something, but it can't, can't come so, too soon for me. At some point I had the idea of whenever ranked play dropped, I was like, well, what if I just like queue the maximum number of games, like just for fun and play as fast as I can. So I queued 12 games at once and then I could just like, at my computer for like four hours straight just taking turns because other people would be flushing through the turns uh fast enough which is kind of silly and like don't recommend it unless you want to like sit at your computer for hours on end that gave me the like oh like i can just like sit by myself and play summoner wars for a while uh which i'd, I'd never had before and then i was like well i could just stream that like if i if i'm gonna sit at my computer and, and be going through 12 different asynchronous games the turns for them that's gonna take like an hour and a half or something like i could just be streaming that and so then i did that and then that that shifted to eventually having some people on to actually play a live game against so just one game against one person and we'd usually like call during it or call after and that's better uh having 12 asynchronous games going at once is in fact pretty silly and i haven't done that in a while but it's it's a fun little experiment to try if you do try it what you have to do is just play as fast as you can you're not allowed to think very hard you just just do it play fast it's fun so i started streaming more of live games against other people and that's and that's what i'm still doing today live games here and there uh which is which is great since i'm no longer in college no longer have a ton of friends that i can play with in person so it's great to have a way to pl play live games to how we started doing the scuffles so some of the inspiration came from the the summoner showdown uh that level 3 cpu and siabata did uh which is essentially we just copied the format <laughs> it's the exact same of just two people face off we comment we commentate and then we talk about it afterwards but what actually like sort of gave us the courage or whatever the impetus to, to start it was jexic uh and fuzzy marmot and i all meeting up in person or it just happened to work out that we that we could once and playing some games and then uh we got closer and started talking about that Ben caught me completely by surprise when he asked, so do you want to host a reboot of the Summoner, you know, the Summoner Showdown? You know, my response as part of a different generation was kind of like, what? Do you expect me to stream on Twitch? But I mean, you know, I didn't have a better answer other than, sure, why not? <laughs> Let's give this a try. I really only committed to, you know, one or two. I was like, I'm willing to try this. I never in my life would have pictured myself streaming on Twitch. Like, that's for kids. <laughs> that's for a younger generation. But I really got hooked. You know, meeting the community and hearing the voices of these people that we've typed, you know, paragraphs and novels to, it was really pretty amazing. Somehow meeting you and Jexic in person took the Summoner Wars server to like another level of community in my mind. We played some games and then we were like sitting just like eating some food and just like talking about different people on the server and different personalities <laughs> and our takes on things and it just made some sense of community like everything felt so real and I, I wanted to do more to like have that feeling like we're just talking in the community. Because we had four of us we had actually played a different game that night. <laughs> But you and I had played some real-time face-to-face uh, Summoner Wars games about a week or two before, probably. It was good, uh, and it's good to. It was great to meet you guys. Well, it's funny. Even the dynamic of that conversation when we went to get dinner, it was funny. It was like a lot more just gossiping and speculating. And now we can just ask. <laughs> you know, now we can just interview people and chat on stream rather than being like, "Hmm, I wonder what Donkey was thinking." I'll say this, though. I think one of the reasons the community is so great is because there are these little pockets of in-person connections. You know, like the three um, members of Team Germany are real-life friends and family. And there's this Polish community that's been playing in person since first edition. And, you know, there's people that come onto the Discord together, like two friends or brothers. And I think that's a big part of the reason why this community feels like a community and not just kind of, you know, Twitter. People, when they have differences, actually resolve their differences rather than just treating it like this drive-by. 
So, I mean, my point was just that the, I think the in-person connections, have, you know, they, they are this little patchwork, not just among the three of us, but, you know, in these little pockets all along. But I, I will say this, though, like definitely meeting you guys was you know, a pretty big turning point for me and how I think of this community. You guys are real people, much more so than, you know, when we're just avatars on a Discord. You saying I don't look like Brub? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, well, that's disheartening. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. In my mind, Aaron is always in a tux. Like, you go for your day at the pharmacy, and you are in a tux. You're gaming with your wife, and you're you're in a tux. Are you, are you not always in a tux? That that photo is just how I always am. I'm always in like full suit, full tux. I, I I never wear anything else. I mean, why would you? Why would you? I feel like it was like talking like that and talking in person about summoner wars that that's the exact same sort of feeling we are creating with the scuffle all of these people that we've that i feel like i've talked to so much online in in channels like it it just it feels it feels a lot more personal to just get to hear their voice and get to hear their story and how they got into summoner wars i didn't really put that together there that those two those two feelings seem very similar and maybe maybe that's part of what got it started but that's that's really a, a lot of uh, our our goal for the scuffle i mean like we play the game of summoner wars that we commentate over uh which is a lot of fun the secret ulterior motive is just it's a lot of fun to get to meet people it's a lot of fun to get to talk with them after the game that's my favorite part ma making those connections in the community with the scuffle absolutely i'm just laughing because i'm thinking about how long it took you to settle on scuffle as the name because you wanted something a little more laid back and fun you know in terms of other possible names we considered skirmish. We considered. I think I suggested like showcase, but you still thought that sounded a little too serious. We considered shindig. That was on the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> of <a silly. laughs> shindig. I think that just reveals my age as a Firefly fan. Like there's just one episode <laughs> named Shindig. But Ben's reasoning of the scuffle is kind of the irrepressible younger sibling of the Summoner Showdown sums it up. Do you guys have like a favorite scuffle you've done so far? How dare you ask that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love them all. <laughs> They're all great. It's great to just get to meet everyone, get to meet all sorts of all sorts of people. Um each 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 one is each one is my favorite for a different reason. I think it's one of the interesting things, too. You've kind of said pretty openly that if someone just wants to be on the scuffle, they just approach you, basically, right? And say, hey, I'd like to do it because it'd be fun. I'm willing to put myself out there. Yeah, and that was... We're trying hard and, like, maybe part of the marketing with the scuffle, too, is, like, I didn't want, like... Showdown was a bit too competitive. Like, I wanted something that, like kind of implied that we don't take ourselves seriously. Is it something that would make people feel comfortable coming on and making a huge misplay and losing the game in front of a live audience and just and laughing it off and chatting afterwards? Like, that's sort of the vibe we want. Of It's just, it's fun to play Summoner Wars. Like, it, it, it's, it's, we, we don't want it to feel too competitive. I'm really hoping you just say that your favorite one was when Shampoo got his revenge on me. And <laughs> <laughs> I had fun when I was on the scuffle, too. It was... It was me and uh, Snalg. That was definitely kind of the turning point one for me because I was really nervous doing the first two scuffles. I think you, I think especially Prophet versus Vexer, you know, first of all, that was a fantastic game. But second, I was nervous about doing justice to two of the top players in Summoner Wars. So even though I think that's one of our best games and best scuffles... I'm not sure enjoyment is the word I would use to describe it because, you know, it was new and I was on stream for the first time and I think it went off well, but I remember it as being kind of nerve wracking. Whereas you versus shampoo was the one that was late enough in the schedule that I could just relax. Like I could actually just chill and you know really have fun with it. And especially getting to chat with you guys and just, you know, everyone had a great sense of humor. And that's definitely the one that kind of cemented it as fun for me. You know, just like, I really enjoy these people and I'm not going to worry anymore about whether I'm stammering too much or there's too many ums and uhs in that last sentence. And we're just here to have fun and be with friends. So that's why that one's kind of a the landmark one for me, you know, the one that says, let's just keep doing this in perpetuity. I'll say also, shout out to the lore scuffle. I don't know that 
you know, it was far from being our most polished one. I remember that one for being the one where, like, my son interrupted screaming over some toddler, you know, calamity. But, like, that one was just fun. How many just tangents we went off of and just how many, just all the different directions people took for... You know, what's going on in this battle? You know, why are Colleen and Malunar locked in this standoff over at the edge of the main battle? So why does Guilford hang out with the goats instead of the birds? We just had a ton of fun with that one. And I, I still have, you know, some of the things that we came up on the fly are still a little bit canon for me. <laughs> and I know that's not how everyone enjoys the game. You know, some people I think really just you know, think of them as units, not as characters. But that's one that's definitely a personal favorite for me, is just really diving into the theme, the art, characters, the story. Yeah, people were talking about doing <laughs> doing more sort of lore content for Summoner Wars. And I know there's going to be some new lore on the official website whenever that comes out. I am super curious about that. And I'll say this too, I think this isn't really answering the question, favorite scuffle. But I think favorite moment that grew out of the scuffles was definitely like Astro Cosmos's Cinderella run to the tournament semifinalists. Because Astro credited the scuffles for, you know, I think powering that run. And that, that actually did mean a lot to me, especially because circling back, one of the worst moments, not knowing where Plaid Hat Games stood on you know, inclusion and identity. There was a moment where um, Astro kind of messaged me is like, yeah, I think, you know, I'm just going to invest less. It just kind of power fade. Like, I'm, I'm just not going to care as much and not going to comment as much. With all the things that happened, including the women's and non-binary channel, including just, you know, more faces showing up, like the two power couples that are playing now. You know, everything that's happened with the scuffles and with getting to know each other and... You know, even if the end of a Cinderella run means getting destroyed by Vexer, you know, it warms my heart that the scuffles were part of that and really part of, you know, Astro just, you know, contributing, you know, strats to all the channels. Just some of the things that they've written is really like could be a strat, you know, a, an SW Zone article unto itself. The statistical takedown of Supervlox, the mechanist in a corner. And I think how to beat Crimson Order, you know, like you don't get voices like that when the Discord's unbridled aggression, you know, like you need to be explicitly inclusive in order to just get that game knowledge to land, you know, to get that person to stick around, you know, to you know stick around long enough to suddenly show how good they are competitively. You know, it's not quite a favorite scuffle, but it's definitely a favorite moment engendered by the scuffles. And Astro was the one that was in the lore scuffle, and we were certainly talking about a lot about lore. Even when we're kind of not being too serious, like, these are really good players. We are streaming people that, you know, just nerd out as much as we do about Summoner Wars. Another moment I just thought of was, I got SIP and Bradolf to be on the scuffle just like randomly. I was like, oh, here's two opponents. It seems like they'd be, be a good match for each other. And then it turns out that they knew each other in person. And SIP, like, at, at university would walk to Bradolf's house to play Summoner Wars in Poland. And, like, I, I just had no idea organizing the scuffle that they had this connection. It was, it was so funny when that came out. It, it's, it's just great hearing, hearing little stories here and there and hearing, hearing little connections that people have with each other. I have another story about this. I didn't know this, um, but there is kind of a rivalry between the Polish contingent in two separate cities. So Adam and Three Run, who we've also had on the scuffle, is a member of the other city, the the not Sip and Bradolf city. <laughs> but they've traveled to play each other in, t um, you know, just for fun and in first edition tournaments back when there was a live scene in, you know, for first edition in Poland. And what Adamant 3 Run told me was that in these first edition live tournament, in-person tournaments in Poland, 10-year-old Sip 
was beating 20-year-old Bradolf. You know, it caught Bradolf completely by surprise. But then fast forward 10 years, and they're playing Summoner Wars 2nd Edition together. And now I guess, you know, once once they're 20 and 30, approximately, I'm not sure the precise ages, but like the the awkwardness of the age gap has worn off. You know, the awkwardness of being defeated by a 10-year-old prodigy has worn off. I think it's easy to do something like that, Ben, though, with the, the Polish community, because the Polish community is like a very strong Summoner Wars community. So you, if you pick just two Polish players, the chance that they knew each other in real life, I think it's fairly decent, because <laughs> the, the Polish community of Summoner Wars is very close-knit, I feel like. I mean, I'm not a part of it. They go way back. The upcoming scuffle with, uh, I mean, it won't be upcoming anymore, but the one that you're going to do with Ciabatta and uh, Redacted Baggins... Everyone loves that thumbnail. Like, was making those kind of like Photoshop things uh, something you did before Summoner Wars, or just like I gotta learn how to do this now that I'm making YouTube videos. I don't want to pay for Photoshop, so I'm using like a janky online like free Adobe software that like doesn't work as well. I have less time these days to to uh, put into making the the very elaborate posters. I don't know. I just <laughs> I think you can see a lot of my humor especially in some of those earlier posters of just like the ridiculous dinosaurs or Krusk with his school bus is so like I just love it. the idea of Krusk just like doing like wheelies with <laughs> this massive <laughs> school bus like I I just I, I love that. Aaron, you have no idea how much art direction I gave to Ben for your scuffle banner. <laughs> <laughs> that was when Ben and I were still you knew enough to be taking it a lot more seriously. So it's just like, tone down the background. You can't see what's going on. Like, I can't see this upside down Jacob with a dog head. I don't get it. <laughs> I remember you told there's like a little there's a little baby Aaron who's a Aaron head on a clinger in the top left. And you told me to get rid of it. And I, I took a stance. <laughs> I said, no, this is this is critical to my vision. <laughs> And later you and later you came around and you said it you said it was good. I think I asked for a couple edits that made it more prominent. Like I was kind of like you have to either commit to this thing or get rid of it. Like you can't just have it this confusing thing in a corner that's kind of half there but not really comprehensible. Yeah, Fuzzy, you have like actual knowledge for like <laughs> for digital <laughs> design. I've, I've never I've never asked you too much, uh, but <laughs> yeah, fu fu I would just like whip up something randomly, and then Fuzzy would be like, "Well, you know, you can't like read any of that." <laughs> <laughs> no, it goes way back. I've done graphic design kind of unofficially for a long time. You know, some you know part of the time as a software engineer, but it's the kind of thing where. If you have both skill sets, no one will ever pay you to do design when you can write code. I'll just leave it at that. Did you guys have any other series that you've ever thought of starting besides the Scuffles? Or any other, like, a continuous content that you thought about doing? Brainstorm different ideas for Scuffle format. Actually, I keep, I, I, I keep wanting to do, like, some sort of team format, but I think it would be hard to make it entertaining. We've wanted to bring back the Beat the Champ format. But to be honest, like between work, kids, and scuffles, I'm kind of at my limit. You know, I always feel like I can't quite play as competitively as I want to because I just can't get as many games as I want to in. So I'm fairly maxed out, and bi weekly scuffle is about what I can do comfortably without overthinking or getting too creative. Summoner Wars Jeopardy coming up in a month is what you're saying? Exactly. Summoner Wars do a lot more work. It'd be fun. I mean, like, there's... Yeah, there, there, there's always ideas, but, like, how to, how to get it to work. Like, especially with, like, the lore... The lore scuffle that we did, it was like, man, like, this could really be a series. Like, this could be a podcast series or something. There's so many other topics that, like, I'd love to talk about more but the scuffle works really well in kind of like an icebreaker like i'm pretty socially awkward but like having having like the game that we've we've just played a game of summoner wars and so we can all laugh and talk about it is a great way to just like start the conversation so i feel like the the, the this this format works pretty well for us over like doing just audio which sometimes like we'll have an hour and a half conversation after the game so it seems like we're almost we're almost just doing that and yeah i'm always playing around with like other other ideas 
for other content as well, like a, a Beat the Champ event and like what I'm doing with Vexer right now, we play a game and then uh, he explains to me how, how I read the matchup was totally wrong and I learned a ton. <laughs> um, think, thinking of ways to do like, to do like a Beat the Champ events or like something that would be like more informative. Like it, it's really interesting to like see a turn and I've done like some little things with like Cheras and some other people I've had on stream, but like you see a turn, you both think of what sort of play you would come up with for that turn and then you present your play to each other and you talk about it and you th and then decide what what the what the best play would be and it's kind of hard to like organize an event like that because it takes a really long amount of time it's it's so like it's better kind of casually but like some sort of event that talked about more like play by play going into the strategy could be interesting as well but I, i'm not sure exactly what that would look like for like a scheduled event sort of thing because you don't want it to like take three hours which was part of the <laughs> part of the issue with the, with the initial beat the champ event when we did it way back streaming live has definitely been a big factor in why i can, can keep going with this because if you allow me to edit then i will get perfectionistic and burn way too much time on it and then just kind of fizzle out but it's been really instructive to me to just see this as an art form. What you get is what you get. You get one shot at it, and whatever happens, you know, whatever calamity or miscall or whatever silly thing I said on stream, it happened, it's in the can, and we move on. Yeah, I've, I've, I've said so many things on stream where, like, afterwards in a conversation with, with somebody. Like, like, usually I try to, like, not say stuff with too much confidence because I'm often wrong and be like, oh, I could be wrong about this, but I think like that doesn't make any sense what they just did there. Like, I feel like you'd want to, do, and then like afterwards in the discussion, they'd just be like, oh no, I was totally missing that Eddie has Volcanic Blast in hand and it's just going <laughs> to destroy Balzar if he advances. Like, and I was so confident when I said that was, that was a misplay. But also about the format, we were chatting be before the podcast about like how, how good of a job Aaron does and like in, in editing the, the podcast together to be coherent. I'm sure I've, I've said so many ums and stumbled over my words that I'm sure you're you're not going to be hearing uh, because of what Aaron does. The scuffle. I mean, I guess maybe it's it's copium, but like I'm just like it's, it's a different sort of thing. Like I listen to lots of like other random Twitch streams and other content where I can just appreciate. It's just like yeah, it's just some people talking and like and it's it's unedited. And if there's a part of the video that's boring, you skip ahead. So like that's just sort of the the candid vibe we're going for there's a few scuffles that i've like that i've ended up editing a little bit but for the most part it's just straight from straight from twitch to youtube just what what you get is what you're gonna get i know at one point i don't know if it was you ben or someone else in the community but somebody had suggested that you have on a bunch of people to just debate tier lists or do like <laughs> a bunch of blind tier lists and have people try and decide like oh i think this is water d's tier list or i think this is aaron's tier list I would love to see that or be a part of it. I think it'd be absolute chaos. Would you think I'd have multiple people on at once or just like do like a one-on-one -on -one with each person? I think you could go either way. I think you could do it one-on-one -on -one and that would be a lot more like calm and not as much debate of how could you put cool deck number one or like how, how could you put Shadow Elves 15th hot takes of Summon Wars. But I think you'd get a better grasp of what that one person actually thought about the different tiers and why they thought those if you did them one-on-one. -on -one. Versus if you did multiple people, it would probably be chaos. Yes. I actually appreciate tier lists as something that you can consume via audio without really needing a visual. Like, I definitely remember using Waterdees and Dunkies tier lists as just workout audio you know without seeing the tiers at all for the most part they you know you could figure out from context what tiers they were talking about and i always wish there were more even though i'm not i've i've said on discord that i'm not necessarily a big tier list person you know i don't necessarily see the point of judging you know polar dwarves commons against like deepwood grokes commons when they're in different factions but i actually loved that as audio content be the first to admit that I find audio much easier to consume than video. Yeah, you know, I don't know how much of my own scuffles I would watch if I weren't the one producing them, but I will always catch audio. I just think it's funny that you say you don't like tier lists when I've heard somewhere, I think from you, that your your children will tier list like foods and ac ac activities. Oh my God. <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. My, I don't know how this happened, but they both find the idea of S tier hilarious. You know, and when you think about it, it is kind of, I don't know if I'd call it hilarious, but certainly odd that S tier goes on top. But no, that is a running joke. It actually helped me understand their board gaming interests a little bit better. I discovered that the kids spread of games isn't that dissimilar but my son will beg and plead and just pile drive to play his c tier games repeatedly whereas my daughter needs to be in pretty much precisely the right mood to play her a minus tier games yeah it's just something about my kids personalities even though i'm their mom and i should be the one who knows them it takes almost some detective work to figure out what makes them tick in terms of gaming i see myself as someone who gaming fills my cup you know gaming recharges me i definitely think my daughter is more if her cup is filled then she's happy to play if her cup is not filled you know with other stuff like playdates with other friends and other things she wants if her cup is not filled then gaming doesn't really help whereas my son is just insane you know my son wants to play board games morning noon and night and he can read just enough to sequence break life he'll he'll look on the shelf and be like when can we play Oh, what did he call it? When can we play Celepender? And you're like, what is Celepender? And then you realize it's Splendor. And he's pretty close. <laughs> so the tier lists have actually been quite instructive as a parenting thing. But that said, do I necessarily need my husband to give me a tier list on Winter Squash? Yes, because he's my husband. But I realize that we're kind of some outlier population somewhere to care this deeply about Blue Hubbard squash being A tier and spaghetti squash being D tier. And he had all these different squash in it, like acorn and butternut, our homegrown Doran round squash and tromboncino squash. So it was an elaborate winter squash tier list. And spaghetti squash D tier. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of rough. Every now and then you get a really good one, but when it's once in a blue moon, then I'm sorry, D tier. I, I have to agree <laughs> with my husband on that. Uh, I have not brought the idea of tier lists home. I think if I brought them back, people like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like, were you just like listening to a podcast or a scuffle or something, or and then, then they overheard you? Like, I'm wondering how this began. You know, I think it might have actually begun when Lil Nips Fatal shared that photo of a license plate of a car, and it was a vanity plate that said S tier. <laughs> you know, I think I showed that to my husband in front of the kids, and the kids just like latched onto it. <laughs> like, once we explained why that was funny, you know, why a photo of a car with a license plate that says S tier is funny, then they just like never let it go after that. Actually, no, now I remember. No, it wasn't that car. That car was later. It was when my husband casually asked me like, hey, so the, do they make tier lists of Summoner Wars factions? Which one's with the S tier faction? So, I mean, he, I haven't really gotten him to play, but he's definitely taken interest and taken interest in just really the different factions in the art. We actually missed seeing Mad Max, you know, entirely. You know, Mad Max Fury Road, because that was the year, like, our daughter was born, and we moved, and just, like, that movie completely fell off our radar. When Sam Goblins came out, I was just like, wait a minute, like, we have to watch this movie. Because <laughs> of the Sand Goblins? Yes. And, you know, it was a great movie, and he appreciated the Sand Goblins faction after that. It's my right joke of the community. Whenever people talk about something being S tier, it's like, yep, Shadow Elves, Sand Goblins, Sky <laughs> Avians, they're all S tier. <laughs> Wayfarers, W tier. My son came up with like a zero tier for games he hasn't played. He demanded to know like what happened to E tier. It's like the gift that keeps on giving. Everything about the tier list, they find some out of the box way to just kind of poke at it including this zero tier for things that, for games they haven't played. I mean, that would make Fungal Dwarves F tier, and I, I don't know about that. But 
we appreciate you guys coming on the podcast and hanging out with us and talking about the community and scuffles and everything you guys have been doing. You know, I appreciate everything you guys are doing. Like, this has been absolutely great. Like, you realize there are a lot of new players on the Discord at this moment for whom there never was a time before the podcast or the scuffle. Yeah, it seems like we're getting more new players lately, for sure. It's always hard to tell. I mean, I think between it's hard to tell whether, you know, are they new players? Are they, you know, are we getting more lurkers to speak up? Clad Hat Games has data that I wish I had you know, when we're guessing, like, how big is the ranked play pool? But it definitely feels like the Discord is more active. You know, it definitely feels like... There's more people just kind of chiming in and starting conversations. And definitely, when I first came here, I was sort of like, do you guys ever talk about anything other than buffing vanguards and nerfing polar dwarves? Like, is there anything to talk about other than these potential buffs and nerfs? And I feel like once Plaid Had Games actually gave in and did that first of all the factions were that much better and second you know conversations moved on like we can talk about the lore we can talk about tier lists we can just you know shoot the breeze about just about anything so it's it's been fun having all these new voices that from my perspective at least have kind of joined since we started doing the podcast and the scuffles for people who want to get in touch with you after this episode or want to chat about different things or find your content where should we direct them you can always see everything new with Summonor's content in the content streaming channel on Discord. Ben10SW on YouTube and Twitch is where everything I do and all the scuffles goes. Made a Twitter account recently, so that I'll also post Summoner Scuffle. <laughs> there might be an underscore in there that will also post scuffles there, but you know, Twitter sucks, etc. I, I tried to retweet for you. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I suggested to Ben creating a Twitter account and then promptly drop the ball on any Twitter interactions. <laughs> but you can find me on the Discord, and that's pretty much my only relevant social media. I'm sure we'll have you guys on again at some point to discuss more in the community and cool things that you're doing. Once again, we appreciate having you here. And Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Appreciate everybody listening to this podcast. This has been Discard for Magic, and we'll see you guys in a couple weeks. 